G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel and this week's edition of True Footy Reacts. At the moment, I'm still trying to kind of work out the format that I'm gonna be going with for the 2019 season, but at the moment I'm thinking on the Monday, I'll do a True Footy Reacts about the previous round and then later in the week, I'll give you my predictions for that round in a separate video. So in each edition of True Footy Reacts, we're gonna go through the previous round and pick out the main talking points. Round one was quite a bizarre round to start with. I think everyone's footy tips got absolutely massacred. I honestly cannot fathom how someone in Australia scored a perfect nine and got the margin right. That's some bullshit. But it actually happened, look it up, his name's Brenton. But other than that, I found the round pretty fascinating actually, and I think there's a real genuine buzz talking about footy already. What's evident to me is that the gap seems to have tightened between a lot of the teams. I think between first and last, there's still a huge gap between whoever the best team is and Gold Coast, but generally there's about 12 or 13 teams you can say probably have a claim to play in finals. And when that's the case, you generally have the recipe for a lot of exciting rounds like this one. I think the first talking point for me was the fact that the reigning premiers got absolutely mauled by Brisbane. They were up six goals to one at quarter time and then had their asses handed to them. Brisbane scored 14 out of the next 16 goals. It was really slippery kind of game and heavily contested and I think that kind of exposed the Eagles weakness. The Eagles are very good at playing when the game is open flowing and they can put their outside skills to good use. But as soon as it becomes a contested centric game, the Eagles kind of struggle. There was an example last year where the Eagles went to Hobart and they just couldn't quite work out the conditions. They got absolutely thumped. So as an Eagles fan, I'm kind of hoping that it's an anomaly like the Hobart game was last year. That's not to make excuses though. Brisbane completely outworked them. And even though the Eagles had a few missing, I think Kennedy, Cripps, Rioli all missed. Plus the fact that they had to play a lot of young forwards. The game was kind of one in the midfield. Brisbane didn't even really give the Eagles that much opportunity to get the ball forward. They kind of smothered the midfield entirely. Lockie Neal and Charlie Cameron in particular are really good ins for the Lions. I know Charlie Cameron played there last year, but he was obviously injured for a lot of that. Lockie Neal was probably close to their best on ground. Charlie Cameron was arguably the match winner and their new recruit Lincoln McCarthy was pretty damn good as well. Kicked four goals and he hasn't been really talked up as a recruit, but I think he had a pretty good JLT too and uh, I think he could prove himself to be quite an underrated acquisition. For the Eagles, the pressure's only gonna keep mounting because they got GWS next week and the Pies at the MCG the following week. And then there's the Derby. But what will come as a relief for them is the fact that all the teams that were considered contenders this year kind of had a setback in their own way. Richmond won, but they lost Rance. Collingwood lost to Geelong. And Melbourne lost to Port Adelaide. It's gonna be very interesting to see how the first month plays out for the reigning premiers. Next up, we have the upset of the round. You know, there was a few to pick from, but I'm gonna to have to go with Melbourne versus Port Adelaide. I've talked up Port for most of the summer, to be honest, and I've made a video about how I think they actually might be better than people expected, but I. I really wouldn't have expected them to win at the MCG, particularly against the Melbourne side that finished last year really well, except for the prelim. It's awesome for them that they have three first round draft picks that they were able to just slot into their side and really provide that outside run and class that they kind of lacked last year. And that problem only got exacerbated by losing Wingard and Poley. So you had Butters, Rosie and Dersma come in and play a role. And on top of that, they had debutant Willem Drew do really well in the midfield. I think he had 21 possessions. And by the sounds of it, they've really torn up the track this preseason. So I wonder if there's new freshness around the playing group now that there's a few new faces. It's only early days in the season, but beating the D's at the MCG ticks a very large box for Port, and they'll be one to watch in the coming weeks. The D's on the other hand looked really sluggish and very sloppy, and they were absolutely dominated in uncontested possessions. Port had more disposals and more tackles, and usually if you've got less of the ball, you should be tackling more, so when the stats flipped around the other way, things are not going particularly well. They also absolutely butchered the ball by foot. Gorn in particular was really well held by Lysette, and I think that may be something he's taken over from West Coast, because Gorn never really dominated the Eagles, so I think Lysette's kind of continuing that streak of being like a tagging Ruckman almost. From the D side, Goodwin kind of referenced the fact that a lot of their players were coming back from surgeries. Kind of sounded like excuses were being made. I mean, it's probably true, but it just doesn't sound good when you say it straight after a loss. But if it is true, then there's reason to feel for Melbourne that things aren't all doom and gloom. It's certainly not panic stations anyway. Now, last week I said that St Kilda and Gold Coast, jokingly, were gonna be an absolute blockbuster of a match. As it turned out, it was probably match of the round. I mean, the standard of the game was a bit appalling. Both sides were really, really bad with their skills, but that was kind of common across the whole league. Personally, I think St Kilda and Gold Coast are probably our bottom two sides this year, but it was still an entertaining game to watch. The Suns pushed them all the way and came back and they nearly won. They probably should have won it in the end with the opportunities they had. I was really kind of hoping the Suns would get a win because with their lack of established talent, that was probably one of their few opportunities to win, let alone in Melbourne. 
But the Saints, I think losing to the Suns at home would have been a disaster and it probably would have pushed Richardson perilously close to losing his job within a matter of weeks. That being said, it must be a massive relief to win that because now they can regroup, have a think about things and try and improve in the coming weeks now they've got four points banked. It's definitely true that the Saints have been injury struck. They've got no Hanabry at the moment. I know Akers missed. Jake Carlisle's out for a while. I'm a big fan of Blake Akers, so I think he's coming in next week, so I think that'll be a really big plus for them, to be honest. If he can realize his prodigious talent, that would be a huge plus for St. Kilda going forward. Now, during the week, I'm led to believe Devin Smith kind of sledged his old side GWS by referring to their ground as a bit of a graveyard, and that has bitch slapped him in the face. The Giants were missing both Kelly and Ward going to this game, and they absolutely decimated the Dons. The overall pressure was just too much for the Dons to handle, and they just mauled them in contested possessions as well. Cornelia had 31 touches and three goals and was one of the best players across the whole league this round. Taranto also went big. He had 31 touches, 10 tackles and two goals. The Giants midfield depth is ridiculous and I think Coniglio is getting close to being the best player of the lot and I think he's a, he's a bit of a Brownlow chance, I gotta say. I also don't think Tim Taranto really gets lauded enough for what he can do. As a third year player to be putting up these numbers semi-consistently, I can't help but think that if he played for Collingwood or Hawthorne, that he'd be a much bigger name in the AFL. The Bombers would be really disappointed with the outing they had. They've been talked up as a potential finals contender, but they really didn't play like it. Shiel had 25 possessions and seven clearances in his first game for the club, but to be honest, like a lot of his teammates, it was hard for him to have really any impact under the pressure that, that the Giants had. Now, where does that leave the Dons? Well, we know they're gonna have 10 amazing games this season. We just don't know which 10. Now, look, I'm not gonna write them off for finals yet, but they do need to get themselves right mentally pretty quick. Now, there was one clear low light for this first round, and that was the fact that we had three bloody ACL injuries. Obviously, Rance went down in game one of the season, Tom Dodo for the Crows, and Ed Vickers-Willis for North Melbourne as well. Between that and concussions, is probably the those two things are the things you wish you could take out of our game completely. Rand in particular obviously is arguably the best key back in the competition, so, so his loss is going to have an enormous effect on Richmond, you'd think. That being said, we've seen time and time again that one player doesn't make a team, so I wouldn't be surprised if Richmond still play to a very similar standard, but does it leave them a bit exposed because I think their next in line is Ryan Garthway and I haven't really seen much of him. I don't think anyone has, to be honest. At the end of the day, it's more about the system. So I'd back Hardwick and Richmond to be able to work their way out of this problem, but it's a blow nonetheless. No, 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 actually, sorry. This is the real low light. Fremantle look like a new team in 2019. No, I'm just kidding. But Fremantle would have been one of the biggest surprises this round with the way they absolutely mauled North Melbourne. Now, being from WA and half of True Footy are Dockers fans, not including myself, but I'm fairly familiar with the Dockers list, so I don't consider myself super surprised by the result. I've always seen the potential with their talent on the list. I think their problems have always been more mental or game plan based or however you want to diagnose it, but for me, I've always thought they had ability. Now, obviously, with Lobb in and Tabin are fit and McCarthy playing well, they've got a functioning forward structure. But more than that, I thought it was their manic pressure on the ball carrier that really won them the game. They were forcing turnovers and errors left and right, and, and that actually gave them the space to deliver the ball well to their forwards like McCarthy. One thing I've noticed is that in the last few drafts, Fremantle have really had a focus on drafting good ball users, and I think it's starting to pay off because their ball use yesterday was fantastic. Now, Fremantle did start the season pretty well last year, so... For them, it's a matter of whether or not they can carry it for 22 rounds and if they can stay fit as well. That being said, they probably played at a standard yesterday we haven't seen in years from them. So very, very positive signs from them. So I don't know about you guys, but I found that round pretty exciting. Now, I'm also being told that it was the lowest scoring first round in 54 years of the AFL and VFL. It's kind of ironic because it's obviously we've just had all these rule changes trying to free up the game and generate more scoring opportunities. Nonetheless, I really enjoyed the football and couldn't really care less about scoring rates. I don't think high scoring games mean more entertainment personally. Now, have we just seen Mark of the Year in round one? I reckon Isaac Heaney could go back to back this year with his effort against the Doggies on Saturday night. Tell me what you think in the comments. Is that gonna win Mark of the Year? Because I reckon it bloody well could. In other news, it seems like Carlton have broken their membership record. Now, they've just went on Wooden Spoon, and while things are definitely looking up, you have to give credit to their supporters. If they're turning up in droves to see Carlton play, and they're not actually winning more games, then, well, that takes a special kind of fan. So, good on you, Carlton. This is a positive shout-out. 
Now throughout the round, we did have several rising star contenders play pretty well. Sam Walsh is probably the most obvious one. He had something like 24 disposals, as did his teammate, Will Satterfield, who's also rising star eligible. Another one that really impressed me was Gold Coast Will Powell. Really took the game on, had a lot of kicks, and I think he scored pretty well in Dream Team as well. I mentioned Will and Drew before. There was also small forward Brent Daniels for GWS, who had a really good game. But one that probably deserves a good shout out is North Melbourne's Bailey Scott. He was almost their most composed midfielder yesterday. He had something like 21 possessions. So I think if he he puts together a full season, he's a chance to finish pretty high in the Rising Star. But it's hard to see anyone eclipsing Walsh, and I think we'll probably get the nomination this week. Now, in terms of fantasy, each week I'm going to give a shout out to the winning team of the round. And this week it was the Habibs, coached by Joshua A, and they scored a massive 2,301. So, good on you, mate. I personally had a bit of a nightmare. I dropped Rockliffe and Sheed despite talking them up all summer. Tried to get Gorn into my team. What the hell was I thinking? Because Rockley scored 166 and Sheed scored 133. So I am fuming. But I've already made some preliminary changes for round two. So I'm coming for you. Also, our tips competition is led by Jacko the Magpie with an astonishing four. But he did get a margin of just two. So well done, Jacko. Good on you, mate. I hope we all go better next round, to be honest. All right, that's all we have time for today on True Footy Reacts. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. We do all kinds of content and, well, I guess I've kind of wrote myself into uploading two videos a week now, so look forward to that. Thanks, guys. Let me know what you thought of the round in the comments. We'll see you next time. Well, slap my ass and call me Dennis Pagan. What an amazing round one. There's no way I'm leaving that in.